This is Applied Calculus, Lesson 1.2, Elementary Functions, Their Graphs and Transformations. This section starts off with a uh, basic list of elementary functions. f of x equals x is the identity function. Remember earlier we said that uh, f of x, h of x, m of x, any of these function names can be replaced with the variable y. So it is called the identity function because it is the same as y equals x which means that any value that x has, y will take on the same value. After that, we have the x squared, which is the square function, x cubed, which is the cube function. These are pretty much self-explanatory between what the function uh, looks like algebraically and the name. And we have the square root function, the cube root function, and the absolute value function. So here are your graphs of the elementary functions. You see the identity function is a line through the origin with slope 1, and the square function is your basic parabola. Your cube function is your uh, basic S-shaped graph. The square root function is uh, half of a parabola on its side. The cube root function is the cube function on its side, and the absolute value function is a V-shaped graph. Uh, vertical shifts and horizontal shifts will just move the function's basic graph left or right or up or down. Um, vertical shifts, you'll notice that the plus or minus is outside of the brackets or parentheses. And horizontal shifts, you'll notice the plus or minus is inside the brackets or the parentheses. Horizontal shifts move in the opposite direction as you would anticipate. So a plus 4 inside the brackets actually moves to the left where a plus 4 outside the brackets moves up. So if it's outside the bracket, it moves as you would anticipate. If it's inside the bracket, it shifts horizontally in the opposite direction that you would expect. And these same rules apply to parabolas. If um, the plus or minus is outside of the parentheses, or there are no parentheses, this would be a vertical shift of 4. But if I were to put it inside the parentheses with the squaring, this would be uh, four units to the left from the origin. Then we have reflections, stretches, and shrinks. These are done by multiplication. So multiplying the parent function, parent function is the basic function that we saw in the first slide. <clears throat> if the number is greater than 1, then you would get a stretch of the graph. If you multiply by a number less than 1, but greater than 0, then we get a shrink, and negative numbers cause reflections. So here's an example. How are the graphs of y equals 2 times the absolute value of x and y equals 0 0.5 times the absolute value of x related to the graph of y equals the absolute value of x? And you can see that uh, y times 2 times the absolute value of x gives you a stretch, a vertical stretch. It makes the graph climb faster, where if you multiply it by 0 0.5, it shrinks the graph vertically or um, flattens it out. So this has a slower slope, and this has a faster slope.
If we look at part B, when they introduce a negative, then it reflects it. But because the number has a value greater than one, it is a reflect and stretch. So here are the summary for graph transformations. If the number is outside of the function's um, argument, then it's going to shift it up or down. If it's inside the function's argument, then it's going to shift it left or right. A negative will reflect. And we have this A value, which will either stretch it or shrink it vertically. We also have piecewise defined functions. So piecewise defined functions have different graphs for different parts of the domain. So here we see um, the absolute value of x is negative x for values less than zero or greater than x for values greater than or equal to zero. And here we see a different piecewise function that has a quadratic graph opening up for values less than zero or a quadratic graph opening down for values greater than zero. So we're asked to graph the piecewise function g of x, and we want to first take note that x could be equal to zero, but cannot be equal to two. So any values between zero and two up to two. So this is going to be an open point at two for this top graph. So zero we can plug in, zero plus one is one. So that could be a closed point because it's got an equal bar on it. And if I plug two in, that brings me up to three. So two, three is going to be an open point and I can connect these. So it's saying I can start at zero and go up to two, but not equal to two. And I have this linear graph. Now, for the second part of the definition, I'm going to take 0.5 times the x value. And I see that x could be equal to two. So two times 0.5 is one. And then I'll do three times 0.5 is 1.5. Four times 0.5 is two. Three times, uh, five times 0.5 is 2.5, then three. So we have a graph that is made of two linear parts. And there is a jump between the left-hand side of two and when we get to two and to the right of the domain. Okay, so this is just to go through another example. Again, notice that if x is less than zero, we can use this top function and we can plug in x equal to zero, but x equal to zero has to be an open point. And if we plug these values in, negative two squared is four minus two is two. Negative 1 squared is 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And 0 squared minus 2 is negative 2. So this one's going to be an open point. So 0, negative 2. That's open. Negative 1, negative 1. And negative 2, positive 2. So we see this is a parabola on this side opening up with an open point here. And then... We see that x is allowed to be equal to zero here. So we'll make our xy table for the right-hand side. We'll do zero, one, two, and two minus zero is two, two minus one squared is one, and two minus two squared is negative two. So at zero, we'll put a closed point at two, one, one, and two, negative two. We have a parabola going in this direction. open, closed. 
And if you were asked, let's say this function's name was f of x. If you were asked what is f of 0, your answer must be 2 because that's the closed point, not negative 2 because that's the open point. Okay, so we looked at piecewise functions with linear and quadratic examples, and we emphasize the importance of noting which point is closed or open, and that, that becomes important for answering questions where you're told to evaluate a function at a point, you must choose the closed point. So that's the end of this lesson. Go back and watch the video, use the guided notes, complete the practice problems, and come to class with questions.